All right, welcome back for section two of chapter 22. Um, today we're going to be talking about the Nixon administration from 1969 to 1974, and we're going to focus on his domestic policy, and tomorrow we'll be covering his foreign policy. So Nixon's personality would bring about his fall from power. Um, though Nixon seemed stiff, uncomfortable, and lacking in charm, and he also lacked the warmth and likability of many other people, um, he was respected for his experience. He was the um, former vice president for Dwight Eisenhower. Um, Nixon was willing to say or do anything to defeat his enemies, um, both political opponents, press leaders of anti-war movement, government bureaucracy, um, and his mindset, if you didn't support him, then you were the enemy. And this kind of mindset is what's going to ultimately get him in trouble. He would surround himself with loyal staff and advisors who would protect him and carry out his orders. And his closest advisors would be H.R. Haldeman and John Ehrlichman, and also Attorney General John Mitchell, who would all eventually fall victim to Nixon's blind ambition. But we'll talk about that in Section 4. So with the appointment of Henry Kissinger as first as his national secretary advisor, or sorry, national security advisor, and then as secretary of state, um, this would be one of his best moves made by Nixon and his administration. Dr. Kissinger would then go on to play a major role in shaping American foreign policy long after Nixon leaves office in disgrace. So Henry Kissinger is going to be a foreign policy genius, um, but we'll talk a lot more about him um, tomorrow. So Nixon will use different methods um, than Democrats to carry out his domestic policy. Inflation had become a major problem and having doubled between 1965 and 1968 due to the rising cost of the Vietnam War. So prices of goods are increasing um, faster than people are getting <coughs> paid. So basically the dollar isn't worth as much money as it should be. And inflation is a steady increase in prices over time that reduces one's ability to buy or purchase goods. And the government was deficit spending or spending more than it was receiving from taxes at the time. Um, and we've talked about that and the government does that all the time. And though unemployment was rising, Nixon's first priority was to halt inflation and control federal spending. And though at first opposed to price controls, even if unemployment was rising, gradually Nixon began to accept deficit spending as a way to stimulate the economy. Though he did try a 90-day wage and price freeze, it would do little to lower inflation and unemployment. So for 90 days, Nixon basically froze everybody's wages and prices. So there, for 90 days, nothing, neither would change. And um, it would ultimately be pretty much ineffective. And so another war in the Middle East in 1973 created problems for the U.S. involving oil. The U.S. support for Israel against Egypt and Syria would anger Arab members of OPEC or the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. This is a group that cooperates to set oil prices and petroleum levels. So OPEC um, is a group of countries that basically set oil prices for everybody else. And OPEC imposed an embargo or ban on shipping of all oil to the U.S., and this sent the cost of oil skyrocketing, adding to the rising inflation now. So because of this, gas prices are going to greatly increase. And the rising inflation caused consumers to cut back on spending, and a recession will occur as unemployment reaches 9%. However, Nixon did hope to halt government spending by ending some of LBJ's social programs. He also suggested substituting workfare for welfare, or sorry, workfare for welfare. Um, in other words, in order to get government assistance, a person must register for job training or accept a job when one is found or welfare payments would end. Though Congress refused workfare, Nixon would gain popularity with conservatives and blue collar workers that were in favor of this. So basically, um, um, at the time, welfare really didn't have a whole lot of strings attached to it, but Nixon wanted to change that, so you must be trying to better yourself and go into job training programs in order to collect welfare, and then if a job's presented to you, you basically have to take it or you're cut off from your welfare. And Nixon would also campaign on a promise to restore law and order in the country, and he blamed the counterculture or 
<clears throat> sorry, the hippies for much of the violence in the street of America. And he appealed to the silent majority or the blue collar and middle class Americans who blamed the student radicals, anti-war pro protesters, the counterculture for rising crime, growing drug use and permissive sex. Ed Nixon also tried to discourage protest, especially against the war, by saying no cause justifies violence, even after National Guard troops shot student demonstrators at Kent State University. And Nixon would also do little to promote civil rights. His Southern strategy was to win over white Southern Democrats who had supported George Wallace in 1968 by doing the following things. So there's going to be four things that he's going to do. First. He's going to slow down desegregation and cut funds used to enforce fair housing laws. Second, he's going to try to prevent, un, even though it was unsuccessful, the extension of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So he's going to try to stop that extension. However, the extension still happened. He's going to refuse to enforce court-ordered busing to help desegregate schools and therefore limit the order's effectiveness and, again, want support from white Southerners and Northern blue collar workers. And he's also gonna restore federal funding to school districts that were still segregated. So at the time, um, if you refuse to desegregate your school district, the federal government stopped giving you money. And um, so basically Nixon's like, eh, if you guys don't desegregate and you're still segregated, we'll still give you money. Just He's just trying to win over votes basically. Um, and so this is going to be kind of unfortunate for African-Americans in the South who are finally making huge gains. And he's going to kind of halt the civil rights movement altogether because of this. So Nixon will also nominate new people to the Supreme Court, which would change the court's attitudes and rulings from liberal to conservative. Uh, Nixon had the opportunity to nominate four new justices to the court, including the new Chief Justice Warren Berger, who was a moderate and a moderate is someone that kind of sits in the middle they're not really a republican not really a democrat they're that person that's going to go with whatever they feel is right that um and wrong more or less um they're going to not necessarily just agree with someone because they're republican issues or agree with just democrat issues they're going to be going and they can view arguments from both sides um so berger on the court as chief justice is actually kind of a good move for nixon and his nominees of Harry Blackman, Lewis Powell, and William Rehnquist all held more conservative views like Nixon. And so those three, those latter three individuals, um, they're going to be a little bit more conservative than Warren Berger was. And finally, on July 20th, 1969, this would be a landmark day in American history. As President John Kennedy's dream of landing a man on the moon comes true as the crew of Apollo 11 astronauts Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon as Michael Collins watched from the command module along with the entire world. So the United States now officially became the first and only nation to put people on the moon. And there are going to be several other um, moon landings to follow after this. I believe the Apollo program ran to Apollo 17 or 18, um, somewhere in there. But I will post a couple um, videos about Apollo 11 in the description for you guys to watch as well as your Google form for today will be posted in the description of the video as well.